Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We welcome everyone to this 13th Herbis Dialogue. My name is Luisa Weiss from the ICLE World Secretariat, and I will be facilitating this webinar from the technical side. Before we start with today's exciting presentations, I want to explain you how we use the system that you have logged on to. So for the duration of the presentations given, you will be muted. However, we welcome your questions and suggestions throughout the webinar. Please do so by typing them into the question box that you see in front of you in the GoToWebinar panel. Also, if you face technical difficulties, please type them in the question box and I'll be happy to help you. I am now handing over to my colleague Tia, who will introduce the Herbis Dialogue series to you. Over to Tia. Welcome everyone to the Urban Biosphere Initiative or Herbis Dialogues. My name is Tia Buckle from the Africa Secretariat for ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability. The Urban Dialogues are a webinar series designed to deal with urban challenges, to share experiences, and to connect change makers in our urban biosphere. Today's topic is Greening the Built Environment, Part 2, Enhancing and Restoring Habitats. Here you can see the advisory board and a series of our partners. Urbis forms the Secretariat and is hosted by ICLE's Cities Biodiversity Center, more commonly known as ICLE CBC. The 15 webinar series is a global platform for online dialogue. It is usually held the first Thursday of every month and is archived for repeated viewing. It brings together representatives of cities and local governments with leading experts from around the world to all share experiences and address specific urban challenges, focusing on the sustainable use of regional biodiversity and ecosystem services in order to support social development in a rapidly urbanizing world. The next Urbis webinar is titled Documenting Nature and the Value of Natural Systems designing a holistic approach to environmental mapping systems for valuation purposes and will occur in July. For today's webinar titled Greening the Built Environment Part 2 Enhancing and Restoring Habitats we have three speakers Bruce Clarkson, Stephen Handel and Lena Chan. Lena will also be facilitating. She is the director of the National Biodiversity Center under the National Parks Board of Singapore. She leads a team of 30 officers who are responsible for a diverse range of actions relevant to biodiversity conservation. Some of the initiatives that Lena has been working on include the development of the City Biodiversity Index, the Pula De Kong Coastal Protection and Mangrove Biodiversity and Health, and lastly, access and benefit genetic resources. Her current official duties also include being the national focal point for the Convention on Biological Diversity, or the CBD, being a member of the Genetic Modification Advisory Committee of Singapore, being a member of the Governing Board of the ASEAN Centre for Biodiversity, and being a member of the Advisory Committee for the Cities and Biodiversity Outlook of the CBD. Lena will be providing a short introduction to today's seminar. Please welcome Lena Chan. Thank you very much, Thea, and also Louisa, um, for so efficiently um, organizing this. I will, I'm delighted to um, have with me today, well, today, this morning, this evening, this tonight, uh, Bruce and Stephen um, to discuss enhancing and storing habitats. This quickly outlines how we're going to proceed. I will introduce about, for about five minutes and then Stephen will um, talk about his experience in urban ecological restoration followed by Bruce who will be sharing with us his experiences on habitat restoration projects in New Zealand. And then I will 
discuss a little bit about the or share a little bit about the habitat enhancement and restoration projects in Singapore. After that, I'll moderate a Q&A session. It is impossible in this one hour webinar to discuss everything, so I thought we just maybe bring in ideas, share ideas, um, have a thought-provoking session, and also just bring out what are the current ideas. And I'm going to divide them into three main groups. Why? Why are we doing habitat restoration? How are we doing it? When? And with whom? So very quickly, why? Why are we carrying out habitat restoration and enhancement that seems to be a trend of many cities, many countries doing it? Because some of these ideas are, some of the reasons are, there's this rapid loss of habitats. Agriculture areas are being abandoned. Urbanized areas are expanding. And people as stall rehabilitate these habitats. It's so important that it's one of the topics that will be discussed in the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of the Parties 13 that will be held in December in 2016 in Mexico. How? How do we go about doing habitat restoration, enhancement? And I'm going to just ideas around that there is a lot of different uh, ways of describing this, um, this, this issue. And there are a wide range of terminology of terms and concepts. Um, Richard Collett wrote a recent paper on it. And these are some of the words that have been used, like enhancement, reconnection, recovery, recreation, reforestation, rehabilitation, reinforcement, reintroduction, remediation, a whole host of different words that are similar in some ways, but subtly different. And there are many methods that are being used. Some of the methods that have been proposed by uh, Stephen Elliott are assisted or accelerated uh, natural generation, framework species method, maximum density method, and there are several frameworks, habitat enhancement frameworks that have been shared by various people, devised by different people. Different methods are used for different situations, but most importantly is capacity building. When do, do, when do we do habitat enhancement? When do we do habitat um, you know, restoration? It depends on the urgency of the situation, the availability of human and financial resources. Agency, the industry, academics, school, national institutions, do we involve the community? What would be the ideal mix? A partnership of stakeholders? So all these are things that we have to consider when we do habitat enhancement and restoration. So I, I'm going to just leave this open for discussion, especially during the question and answer sessions. Please feel free to share it um, you know, with us, your experiences and your views on these ideas. May I now invite Stephen to give his presentation on urban ecological restoration. Over to you, Stephen. Talking to you from New Jersey in the eastern United States. Ecologist, and I'm interested in studying plant reproduction and spread and what determines the kinds of plants that live in any one area. Most plant ecologists work in the natural parts of the world, or parks and preserves. But I've chosen to work in cities where most people live and work. The world is becoming more urban, and the need for natural habitats in cities is becoming more and more important. 
these are the kinds of places I work on. This is an abandoned lot in a city in, in the United States. The ground is broken concrete and asphalt. Nothing very pretty, is it? Some plants grow here, weeds that have come in from around the world, but it's nothing like the original biodiversity of this part of North America. Here's another site that I work on. It's an abandoned commercial port in the city of New York. That's the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. This once was a beautiful coastal habitat, but for hundreds of years it was used for commerce. There's almost nothing alive in this picture, not even under the water, which has been scraped clean. What's possible here now that the commercial aspects have closed? Can we bring back habitats to this urban setting? And here's another picture. This is an urban landfill. Almost every city in the world has landfills for their garbage. Typically, the engineers dump the garbage, cover it up with some soil, and then put grass seed on top so that the rains don't erode the soil. The biodiversity here is just a few species of grasses. Can we do better? These sites, some of them are quite large, are where millions of people live. Can we make these sites more useful for people? This, of course, is what we want. This is a snapshot of a, another slope, a, a natural area near where I live. This picture shows woodland in the background, a meadow in the middle, and a wetland at the bottom where the soils are so wet. Oh, there's probably 200 or 250 plant species in this picture, and it's habitats which aren't really maintained. They're sustainable in the real sense of every year they stay like this. Oh, the borders will change a little in wet and dry years, uh, but generally this will keep going for many, many decades. How can we get this kind of habitat back into our urban areas instead of those barren and sterile landfills? We're interested in doing urban ecological restoration not just because nature is so pretty, but also because nature is valuable. It gives us ecosystem services, as we now call them. Having small patches of habitat in our cities helps clean the air and groundwater. It mitigates against floods and droughts as climate changes. It helps to make and preserve soil, stopping erosion into our waterways if we have healthy habitats with root systems. The plants also suck up nutrients and stop damage to our waterways uh, by eutrophication. And finally, in a world of rapidly changing climate, living habitats where we live and work can help cool and stabilize the climate, making a healthier environment for our citizens. These are the things that drive urban restoration ecology, not just the beauty and enjoyment of nature. What then can we do to bring back these kinds of habitats in urban areas which are now degraded or destroyed? Well, it's, I'm afraid it's not that easy, and there are many problems we have to try to overcome. For example, cities are hot. The asphalt and buildings we've put together make the air many degrees warmer than surrounding rural and natural areas. So not all native species can live within cities because of the stress of heat. As the climate changes rather rapidly, this heat island effect will be uh, made even worse. When we design urban restoration, we have to keep in mind that we're in a hot area, not, not a historically cooler area. A second problem is fragmentation. Uh, this drawing shows the New York metropolitan area. Manhattan is in the middle there between the two rivers. The natural areas and parks here are the little green spots. Everything else, the gray areas, are us, our roads, our homes, our factories. The natural areas are separated by very unfavorable areas. If an animal or a plant seed wants to move from one green area to the next, it has to cross over our civilization, a very, very stressful uh, and dangerous area. Not all plants and animals can live in these small green areas surrounded by urbanization. 
again, the target for restoration must reflect these small areas that we have to work with. Any one of these areas could be burned or even rezoned by a government, and we would lose it. Somehow, plants and animals have to move from one patch to the other uh, over this dangerous matrix. Another problem is that we start with very degraded landscapes. We don't have natural, healthy soils upon which to plant new species, but we have land which has other land uses and garbage that has been added over the many decades. This has to be overcome, starting with an attention to soil. How can we get this soil healthier before we try to establish plant and animal communities? Another problem is biological. All of our cities throughout the world have new species that have come in from other continents. They're aggressive, they have rapid population growth, and they cover up many of our native species. They must be managed every year. This picture shows a vine from Asia which has come to the United States and sweeps through our woodlands covering up canopy trees. After a few years this tree dies and falls and the vine crawls up the next one. It's a terrible problem and there are similar problems everywhere. And finally we have to pick the target what do we want to restore in our cities? Given all these problems, we can't get back to a very historic biodiversity in many cases. This little artwork shows a man coming out of a metro, a subway, uh, into a world. Well, the world he sees is an ancient forest. These plants have been long extinct. Of course we can't bring those back, but can we even bring back the plants that lived here 100 years ago, given all these new stresses? physical and biological. Choosing the ecological target for our projects is one of the most important things we can do and it must take uh, much, much care. I'd like to tell you now how I approach ecological restoration here in New York City, uh, America's biggest city. I'm on a huge landfill, uh, about 500 hectares. Everything above the water is garbage, which has been dumped here by the city officials. What can we do here to make this a healthy environment to give us ecological services for our people? Well, uh, this has been the approach we've taken. After the soil is placed and improved, we wanted to know whether we could bring back ecological links. Oh, the city doesn't have enough money to plant this like a large garden. But can ecology bring back species and individuals of plants that aren't there now? In many habitats throughout the world, it's fleshy fruit on many plant species and then move about and the seeds come to their bottom. This ecological succession is a typical ecological process. Can we bring it back to a vast landfill in a major city. We tested this by putting in small patches of native trees and shrubs on the landfill. These then grow up and make their own seeds and birds can come in from elsewhere perhaps bringing in seeds in their gut which will get onto the ground and start building a new habitat. Is this possible in a major city on a degraded landfill? Well we tested this by putting little seeds to see if any seeds were brought in by the birds. Again, look at roads and a tank farm, a very, very difficult area. This is not Yellowstone National Park in the States. These are the kinds of data we get, seeds in the traps. We can identify these using uh, library resources. And we found that even in this vast landfill, many, many seeds came in. In this first experiment, we had 65 square meters of traps, and we got over 14,000 seeds come in in the first year of about 25 species. It was a remarkable finding showing that this link in nature can be reestablished, getting new healthy species in from afar without an expense by the government officials. The seeds come in from these small remnant habitats that surround 
the landfill. Here's a small uh, woodland remnant. It's about two hectares. Uh, nothing valuable, nothing rare. And this is where the birds live and where the seeds form to be carried into the landfill where I'm standing. These small remnant habitats have great value and we as uh, members of the environmental community have to convince governments to save them, not simply tear them down and build another pizzeria or some more housing. The second link we studied was the making of seeds on these urban sites. Would pollinators come in to visit the flowers and then start the creation of seeds? So we studied flowers that uh, plants we planted to see how many of them made a seed. And we found, again, a very optimistic finding. On this large landfill, we got about 60 species of wild bees come in. They were living in the gardens and yards around the landfill, and they visited the flowers at the same rate as plants of the same species in natural areas. Thousands of seeds were made in, on site. This link in nature can also be established in our cities. Faunas are quite diverse and still functioning. We can encourage the presence of pollinators on our urban sites very simply by putting in piles of dirt of different textures on the ground. This is where many bee species nest, and if we give them nesting habitat, they can move here and start serving the plants, enhancing our urban habitats. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, one of our landfill restorations, 18 years after we started those patches of plants and as you see it's become a very nice healthy woodland much of the ground is covered by a young forest and a healthy herbaceous layer has grown up underneath plants you see here are naturally dispersed to the site by birds and by a few surrounding areas I'd like to give you a case study of how we've applied these ecological principles to creation of a new urban parkland. Uh, this picture shows New York Harbor, with Manhattan in the middle. I studied on the right of your picture where you see those white piers sticking out into the East River. That's the part of New York City called Brooklyn. That's where all the yuppies want to live now in America. Uh, But it's too small for modern container ships, needs of modern trucking, so it fell into disuse. And the city was using it for nothing but just storage. The city and the state decided to make this into a new park, the Brooklyn Bridge Park. You see the bridge in the background. We were brought in to decide what kinds of habitats could possibly be brought in to this old industrial site. This is a de the design for this park. The design was headed by the Michael Van Volkenberg Associates, famous landscape architects of America who work around the world. What you see here is the new park. It's about two kilometers long, but only about 200 kilometers were kept. They were very strong and made into habitat for social activities as well as environmental enhancement. In this area, we decided we could put in many kinds of habitats, even though it was quite small. Woodlands, shrublands, wetlands and swales collecting stormwater from the city streets, open meadows for pollinators and butterflies, and even in the water, which had been so degraded by commerce, we could add fringing uplands, salt marsh grasses in the salt water, the East River is salty, and also submarine habitats to improve habitat for crabs and fishes which build the food web in the marine environment. We wanted many kinds of habitats even in this small area because we felt they were necessary. Different birds have different complex life histories. Sometimes they're in the woods, sometimes they're in the meadows. They feed in the meadows in the morning as they warm up more quickly than the woods, than the woods in the afternoon as the day gets hot. 
Woodlands are needed as protection from storms and predators, even of animals that like to spend most of their time out in the open or in meadows. And we know that climate change is occurring, and we have to have different kinds of habitats, because some will expand and others will retreat over the years as climate changes. We don't want to replant this park every few decades. That would cost a fortune. And finally, the people of the city like different kinds of habitats. Some people want to sit in the sun. Maximizing the attraction of the park to the people who support it financially and politically over the years. Diverse habitats gives us stability and sustainability as the years go by. Uh, here's a drawing early on of what the park was going to look like. Instead of the asphalt and stone, it was going to be a suite of salt marshes for people to boat in, young woodlands, you see some roost sumacs over on the side, and meadows for the people of the city to enjoy. Instead of being closed off as abandoned commercial zone, it's a welcoming park. And here's a picture of the park now after it's been built. Uh, the water is cleaned storm water from the city. And the habitats uh, in this picture are wetland emergent herbs, flowering shrubs, and young trees. The park is a great social success. Hundreds of thousands of people visited it every week in the summer, and it's a big part of life in New York City, as well as giving us those ecological services of cool air and water. There's another value to this park, too, I have to mention. We're a coastal park, and it's visited by shorebirds, such as these egrets. The park sits uh, near Manhattan, uh, that middle Network. It's part of a large landscape ecology. The birds move about the vast landscape from the rookery you see uh, all around the city. If one of those rookeries with the bird uh, pictures in them is damaged or destroyed, the birds can move elsewhere. Brooklyn Bridge Park in the middle enhances and strengthens all the other habitats around the city. There's a landscape ecology advantage in addition to the advantages we built into this one small part of the city. It's a value added. Don't ever think your investment in one site doesn't have more value elsewhere in the vast urban landscape. And difficulties, but they can be overcome by a trained team and different skill sets working together, ecologists, landscape architects, engineers, educators. There are dispersal barriers because we are fragmented. The existing plants and animals in cities are not the original rich biodiversity. They've been degraded by human use. We may have to bring back species from elsewhere. The soil, as I've stressed, can be very poor and lacking the microbes and fungi needed for healthy soil. Soil has to be studied and improved before we add plants. Invasive species, plants, and insects are every from destroying the healthy biodiversity we seek. Our operations are fragmented, and that limits what we can do. And finally, cities are hot, hotter than surrounding areas. And we must carefully pick the target for the real conditions, not a romantic view of what was there in the past. But the opportunities are enormous. This is my last slide. We want to bring back those ecological functions to improve a healthy lifestyle for our people. We need resiliency for biodiversity in a changing world. We're interested in bringing back our natural heritage, a sense of place. People love their homes. We want to show the special flavor and diversity of homes in each part of our world cities. No city has much money, and natural habitats are less expensive to regional biodiversity advantage. Any advantage in one little area 
can help support populations and communities in other parts of the city. And finally, we can advance environmental education. We're so interested around the world in improving science education for our children. Small patches of urban landscapes can serve that purpose too, uh, improving outdoor education and an understanding of the living world. So in this way, we help improve the future lives of our children as well as our daily lives for ourselves. That's how I, as a plant ecologist, approach this. biodiversity in a very challenging environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. There's been an insightful and thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, we, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and you know, people will be interested in finding more about your experiences. Um, may I now invite uh, Bruce to give your, um, share your experiences. Bruce, thank you. is to tell you a little bit about the urban habitat restoration that we've been undertaking in the city where I live in Hamilton, New Zealand. I thought I'd just remind the all the overseas listeners about where New Zealand is and how it fits into the bigger biodiversity picture. So New Zealand is that little landmass sitting at the top of this world here in this in this map. And New Zealand has been described by the writer, the author, Rudyard Kipling in relation to these key words, last, loneliest, loveliest, exquisite, apart. What Kipling was referring to was that New Zealand was one of the last major land masses in the world inhabited by human beings approximately 700 years ago. The loveliest and exquisite are value judgments which anybody can assess for themselves if they come and visit my country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. The city where I live is in the North Island of New Zealand and it's shown on the, on the map here. It's a river city. It has the largest river in New Zealand flowing through it and calling it a city by international standards probably is a bit of an exaggeration. So it's only 150,000 people and in fact, there is only really one major city in New Zealand that, that exceeds, exceeds one million people. So although New Zealand is a they are small cities and towns. I've been interested in restoring indigenous biodiversity for quite a long time. I started first in the wildlands, the backcountry, and as I've become older and less mobile, I guess my attention has turned to the urban environment. It's quite important to understand the context of what's going on in my country before I start talking a little bit about the urban setting. So this visual shows the city of Hamilton Completely surrounding it, the pale green colour is agricultural land. Largely dairy cows and milk production is the major source of revenue. New Zealanders have been extremely effective in removing large traces, pretty well all traces, of indigenous vegetation and ecosystems across the wider landscape in the lowland and coastal zones. And to see real indigenous forest, indigenous vegetation, you have to travel about 15 kilometres out of the city onto the low hills that surround the basin. And you can see the dark green colour there on the visual. That, that's the location of the closest stands of indigenous forest. So in terms of the amount of indigenous vegetation left within the city, there's only a little under 2% of, of the original extent of indigenous vegetation remaining within our city, Hamilton. That forest, of course, is highly fragmented. Uh, small patches, 
And the one in the visual here is the largest patch of the original forest cover of the whole region, a type of forest which we refer to as swamp forest or semi-swamp forest, dominated by members of the family Podocarpaceae, and the common name for the tree is Kahikatea the Māori, the Polynesian name for it, Kahikatea or white pine. So the largest remnant left within our city boundary is only 5.2 hectares, and across the whole of our city, the average patch size of remaining forest is approximately 1.1 hectare, and it's spread in 67 discrete little patches. So because the New Zealand flora is so so unique in a sense because of the very high levels of endemism and because of the massive extent of transformation of the landscape that's occurred in the last 200 years of human settlement, many people around New Zealand have decided that it's time to restore the balance and to bring back indigenous flora and fauna and particularly to bring them back to our own backyard into the urban environment where people can see and appreciate the what is essentially the natural heritage of our country. So in the city where I'm operating, we've decided to focus our attention in this landscape unit, this landform unit called the Hamilton Gully. Because the city is so flat and because we've been so effective at removing all of the indigenous ecosystems, we have very few places that we can actually go to restore the indigenous vegetation. And when I say restore, what I mean is restoring in the sense of enhancing those existing small patches, but more importantly, expanding them and extending them to reconnect them. And the term that I use for that is reconstruction. So the place that we've focused our attention is the Hamilton Gully. The Hamilton Gullies are the tributaries or the streams that flow into the main river, the Waikato River, which runs right through the centre of our city. And you can see that dendritic pattern, the drainage pattern there, formed by those streams that sit within the Hamilton Gullies. Those have all been formed by a process known as spring sapping. So underground flow of water from enormous peat bogs that occupied the basin, the Hamilton Basin originally, flowed underground and where the water emerged on the banks spring sapping to form these very intricate gut spread across our city. They make up about 8% of the city area. The city is approximately 10,000 hectares in extent, and so we, we've focused our attention on trying to bring back native plants in particular into these gully sites. The first gully plantings, the first restoration plantings that were done in this way started about 50 years ago, and we formed a formal group called the Gully Restoration Program in about the year 2000, which really built the momentum towards bringing back indigenous plants into the urban environment. So this is what our gully system looks like in the city. And you can see there that there's, there's the ribbons of, of gully running right through the city with the suburban landscape, the little houses there, largely with their quarter acre sections, um, forming a pattern across the whole of the city. So the gully is the There are some clues about what the system used to be like in terms of the floristic composition in the place names that are found across our city. So the word there, manga ko tukutuku, which is a Māori or a Polynesian word, refers to the giant fuchsia, the tree fuchsia, which was once found in the gullies when Māori first settled this land. And so we've used a range of clues and techniques to consider how we might bring back something like the original. 
I'll get on to that shortly and talk a little bit about our actual target ecosystem. But before I do, this is what confronts us in most Hamilton gullies. It's become very f fashionable. At least novel ecosystems, but um, we we believe that it is to convert these systems back to ones which are dominated by indigenous species. So the novel ecosystem found in Hamilton gullies is essentially one dominated by willows, deciduous trees, and the particular willow here is grey willow, uh, Salix cinerea. You can see there that there's an overstory of trees and in underneath it sometimes there will be elements of the original indigenous flora. So the two that can be seen in the in the view there one of our cordelines or cabbage trees. So the difference between this novel ecosystem and our indigenous forests that used to occupy the site is that the indigenous system was dominated by evergreen trees and a lot of evergreen trees which produce nectivorous flowers which were useful for the, our nectar feeding birds. By contrast, in the form of flowers are not as valuable, don't provide this, this need for many of our important native birds. And so this is why we really need to consider how to change this system from one dominated by the deciduous exotic invader back into a system dominated by indigenous I would say something about our target ecosystem. We've constructed past using information, uh, pollen analysis, um, peat cores, uh, from collecting macrofossils and stream beds, and from consulting the diaries and notebooks of the surveyors, the European surveys who first came to our city and marked out the sections. We've used all of those lines of evidence to put together an a picture, if you like, of what the is that it has a number of very distinct within it. And it's really important to know how you match the species you want to bring back to those micro typographic types. So they're shown there on the diagram on the x axis, the hill slope and crest the foot slope, the back swamp, the levee, the stream itself, the terrace peatlands and the foot slopes, all of them had a different floristic composition and we know what it was and so it is potentially possible to bring back all of the major ingredients because in New Zealand as far as plants are concerned anyway, in our total history we have only seen the loss of six plant species. The, the difference with birds, of course, is enormous because we've lost so many bird species, approximately 55 species of birds have become extinct since European and Maori arrival, that we can never hope to bring back the full complement of birds, but certainly for plants we can get most of the major ingredients back into the system. So our approach generally has been the one of using natural succession as a framework for reconstruction. So we have, we've observed the natural system, we've seen what the nat natural successional pattern is and we use that as a framework for then rebuilding an ecosystem. And in so doing, we're taking up that ultimate challenge for ecologists, the ultimate challenge that was laid down by Tony Bradshaw, one of the fathers of restoration, if you like, is the ultimate challenge is to reconstruct ecosystems. So we've been trying to reconstruct ecosystems. Now we know what the ingredients were from that work that we've done on determining our target ecosystem and we know where we have to go to get most of those ingredients. 
But as I said, it's not just a matter of getting a whole lot of plants and putting them onto the site. It's the matter, a matter of using a successional framework to do it in a way in which you mimic natural successional processes. Like many parts of the world, of our plans to do this style of restoration. In New Zealand, in terms of plant species, we have approximately 2,500 native species, and approximately 80% of those are endemic to New Zealand. That is found nowhere else in the world. On the other side of the ledger, unfortunately, we now have more than 2,000 500 exotic vascular plants that we have to manage and deal with if we're trying to do restorations of this style. So using that successional framework then, we start out by planting sites up with early successional plants. These are just some examples of early successional plants from the New Zealand flora, the flax, the formium on the left and the cabbage tree in the middle and some others on the right there. And of course the traits that these species have is often they have small seeds, often wind dispersed, they're light demanding species, they tend to be relatively short lived and have comparatively high growth rates. Once you've established a crop of early succession plants, or sometimes we'll call them pioneers, you can then consider bringing in mid-successional species. And this is just a few examples of some of our mid-successional plants that we use in these reconstruction processes. So on the left is our nightia, our native protea in New Zealand. And on the right, we have a couple of angiosperm trees that are a very good mid-successional plants to bring in in a restoration. The malocytis at the top and the hoheria at the bottom. And then of course once you've paved the way and, and caused that change in the environment, it is then often possible to bring in late successional species. The characteristics of late successional species tend to be that they are the ones that have the large seeds, they are often bird or animal dispersed, they are often the ones that are completely absent from the urban environment because of the isolation, the fragmentation and the, and the transformation of the landscape that's occurred in the past. They are shade tolerant species, they tend to be long lived and have much slower growth rates. So just a couple of examples there. In the image, we have the member of Podocarpaceae on the left, which is the Dacridium genus, and the one on the right, Disoxylum or Koekoe, a really sensitive, shade-tolerant tree that must be established under the canopy of other species before it can be successful in establishing. So now just to show you visually, the process of restoration planting that we undertake in Hamilton City. So here's what it looks like at two years and, and the system that we use is that we do plant trees and shrubs. We bring them back. We can't use some of the techniques used in other countries where people rely on sowing of seed. We actually have to bring back the plant and plant it in the ground and get the, get the system started. So at two years, this is what it looks like. At five years, starting to make progress, you're starting to get a bit of canopy closure and the trees and shrubs are starting to get closer together. And the critical part of this story is that it's the canopy closure that we're trying to achieve in restoring a forest because once we get control of the canopy, we get canopy closure and then many of the weeds which are light demanding and grow on the floor, on the ground layer, will be outcompeted by the new, new vigorously growing young trees. Or enhancement planting. And that involves coming in to near or early successional crop and coming in amongst it finding suitable sites, uh, little light wells, little light gaps, particularly important, and planting some of the mid-successional, uh, 
intermediate requiring species or late successional species into those sites. So here's some examples of how far you can get in quite, quite a short time. Uh, this is one of our gullies called Mangaiti on the left where we have completely removed a willow The back swamp here is dominated by native sedge in the genus Carex. And you can see in the image the other important aspect of this restoration program, and that is recreational opportunities. So Hamilton City now has, associated with all of its gully restorations, boardwalks like the one shown in the image there, in which you can walk pretty well walk or cycle from one end of the city to the other. And of course this is the other benefit that this focus on biodiversity restoration brings is all of the benefits inside is an image taken in my own backyard where I so I, I actually, along with my wife Bev, have spent the last twenty years or more restoring a semi-swamp forest in my own backyard in the Hamilton Gully that we back onto with our house. And so this is the restoration as it is now after about 20 years and it includes members of Potocarpaceae, the Kahikatea, and in the foreground some of the swamp species like the Formium and the Carex. So after 20 years there, the question is would you consider that to be restored? So taking that same image and blowing it up, we can perhaps contemplate that idea as have we actually got to a point where one would consider it to be restored? Well, the only way to know that would be to compare it with a natural site and see how it matches up in terms of structure, composition, uh, some of the ecosystem functions like decomposition, uh, nutrient cycling, whatever you might want to pick. And of course the answer is it's still got a long way to go because if some of the main trees which dominated this original system live in some cases for 500 to 800 years, then you're only a very short way along the journey of restoring a functioning forest ecosystem. So here we are with a bit longer time span to get an idea of what it looks like. This is on a, more, on a drier site a foot slope site near a gully, 40 years worth of planting and we've now got complete canopy closure and the issue now is we are lacking some significant understory, shrub layer and ground cover native species. So after getting the structure of the forest right, you then have to come in of course with the shade tolerant shrubs and the shade tolerant ground cover and try to build the whole forest ecosystem. But after 40 years, you've definitely got a system where you've got control of the ground layer through complete canopy closure and you have a chance of winning the war against all of those exotic weeds that are found in the city. And of course this is, is sort of looking like it would be if we'd been doing it for a hundred years and of course we haven't. again helping guide us and lead us towards the trying to achieve. So having been reasonably successful in restoring a large part of the Hamilton Gully system, more recently in 2004 we were able to convince the City Council in Hamilton that we should have a different sort of park established within the city and we call this a natural heritage park. Of the city, an area extending for 60 hectares and covering the full range of topographic condition was representative of the original Hamilton Basin where the city is located. So in the center of the image there we have a small peat lake and we have a little miniature catchment if you like and shown on the, on the map there are the target ecosystems 
for the development of this new type of park, a natural heritage park. So you can see on the legend there the different um, ecosystem types that we're trying to establish. So we've been at this project for about 12 years. And what does that look like? Well, using Google Maps, of course, quite a useful tool, Google Earth, you can see the beginning in 2004 there, agricultural land completely denuded of any trace of indigenous ecosystem in 2004. The peat lake at that time with a fringe of that grey willow. And by 2014, you can see the emerging plantings starting to develop there. Over 20 hectares established by 2014 of some of those target ecosystems that we're aspiring to. Well, of course, how do we do that? The way we do a lot of this work, of course, is working closely with communities, working with schools, working with businesses, working with basically the citizens of the city and involving them in the process of reconstructing the ecosystems. This image was taken uh, just recently, 3rd of June, on our Arbor Day planting, where we assembled 1,800 people uh, on a Friday morning. Um, 1,800 people, <clears throat> 28,000 plants, and we were able to plant up a further three hectares of our 60 hectares in three hours. This is the power of urban environments and urban restoration. The biggest advantage that you have in these systems is ready access to volunteer labour, involving the community, involving the community in what is a a valuable and health promoting activity and, a, and an activity which builds social cohesion into the city. So you know the notion of everybody assembling and working together on a project is very good for community health, not just for the health of ecosystems. So I've been talking a lot about plants up until now and I just needed to make getting towards the final part of my talk to make some comment about animals and particularly in New Zealand. New Zealanders are infatuated with their native birds and the big goal in urban restoration in New Zealand's cities really is trying to replace all of the exotic birds with native birds. This is one of our nectar feeding birds, the tui, and the tui is often used as the focal species or the umbrella species if you like for the restoration that is being undertaken on the site. And in our city, Hamilton City, for 120 years the Tui had been absent. And so we started restoring this habitat not just for the sake of the plants but also thinking about of habitat enhancement and pest control, we've reached what we call the TUI tipping point. So if you look at the, the numbers on the left hand column there, reported sightings of the TUI bird, 2007-11, 2008 28 2009 roughly, we reached the TUI tipping point, a combination of habitat enhancement and pest control, and when I say pest control, killing rats, possums, Australian possums that is, weasels, stoats and all of those pests in the peri-urban to recolonize the city um, and not visit but starting to nest within the city. So just to uh, conclude then, in terms of the restoration planting process itself, the main findings from the research that we've done all the way through this program are summarised on the slide here. Plant site selection is critical, mimicking the natural succession is important. Because we have a reliable uh, rainfall and a mild climate, we can achieve good canopy cover of this new and
still have to be very careful about aftercare in the early stages and particularly 10 to 15 where when that pioneer crop of trees starts to die back it may open up gaps and allow particularly smothering exotic vines to get back into the system and so the aftercare needs to be targeted particularly to that 10 to 15 year uh, period and of course combined with that is enhancement planting, bringing back the mid-successional species and the late successional species that continue more resilient to invasion by exotic species. Of course we've found too much about ferns, ferns with their light wind dispersed spores, as soon as you get the humidity that you get from a good forest cover, the ferns start to arrive on their own without assistance and even some of the epiphytes will come back. About 50% of the native epiphyte species will arrive unaided. Perhaps the most surprising of our findings has been that regeneration of the system actually starts much sooner than we would have ever expected. And so um, we've found that we can start getting trees, trees that have lifespans of 100 and 200 years actually start flowering within 7 to 10 years and start producing fruit and seed often within that time frame and regeneration begins quite quickly and is significant, particularly significant by 10, 15 and 20 years. So we're well along a journey, if you like, of reconstructing some of the indigenous ecosystems that once characterised Hamilton City in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Bruce, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk and some valuable experiences that we can pick up, yeah. I'm going to now share with you some of our habitat enhancement and restoration um, experiences in Singapore. Most people would think the impression of Singapore, when you mention Singapore, they would think shopping, Orchard Road, you know, big city, densely populated, you know, uh, uh, people rushing around. Is there biodiversity in Singapore? More than recorded 2,000 native vascular plant is about 384 bird species. Well, talking about vascular plant species, we were actually quite surprised. We do uh, survey our plants quite a bit, and yet last year we discovered three new endemic species, one ginger and two hanguana species, right under our noses and we didn't even know they existed. The 384 bird species, more than the total number of bird species that you can find in France. And we have, again, uh, cited 318 butterfly species, 125 dragonfly species, all in a small part of Singapore. It's not only our terrestrial species, but also our marine species. We have 255 hard coral species, and that's more than one-third of the world's 800 hard coral species. 50 sea anemone species actually trying to get her over to Singapore, and she said, oh, bother, but fortunately she did come along, and she found 50 sea anemone species, and probably some more new records or new species. Um, and that's more than a number of sea anemone species on the western coastline of North It's not only species, but we have 
or more than 10 ecosystems in Singapore. Rainforests, primary forests, different kinds of secondary forests, freshwater swamps, streams. Who would have thought you would actually have a nice, gurgling, cool stream running in Singapore? Uh, freshwater marshes, grassland, mangroves, sea grasses, intertidal mud flats, rocky coastline, coral reefs, and deep sea, not so deep. And a very important ecosystem that Stephen had talked about, urban ecosystem. And all these are precious to us because they will help us survive climate change. Ecological resilience is extremely important, which is why we want to keep all our species as much as we can and ecosystems. Just a few facts. Singapore is a tiny island with an area of 718 square kilometers. I work for the National Parks Board, which is the government agency responsible for greenery and biodiversity conservation. Our responsibilities range from formulating policies to actually spearheading research in ecology, plant taxonomy, horticulture, and then implement them. So we are an agency that goes right from cradle, right range to the other end of the spectrum of implementation. And Parks manages two national parks, which is and Fort Canning Park. We have four nature reserves, Bukitima Nature Reserve, Central Catchment Nature Reserve, which are right smack in the middle, and they comprise, they harbour primary forests, secondary forests, streams, freshwater stream, uh, swarms, as well as streams and We also manage 350 parks. And these parks have a diversity of types. They range from nature parks, which have a lot of natural ecosystems, right up to horticultural parks. They range, they are regional parks, large regional parks, and they could be small neighborhood parks. We also manage 300 kilometers of park connectors. How do we then link up all these areas? Instead, MPARS also manage 3,500 kilometers of streetscape. Years ago, we used to plant trees evenly spaced of very similar species type. You know, the um, we plant rain tree, the flame of the forest, Angsana, which is Pterocarpus indica. So we used to have just a few species. Native as well as exotic plants. Our legacy is to populate our streetscape the way that the forest thrives which is multi-layering 
And so we have tall trees, and in between we have ranges of different sizes, different species of trees and shrubs. So these plants do a whole host of provide a whole host of ecosystem services, are habitats for birds, butterflies, reptiles, amphibians, and they also help us mitigate climate change effects. Well, both of them, both Stephen and Bruce, talked about how they approach enhancement. We have an ecological framework that we follow. First of all, we ask questions like, why do we want to do this project? What are the reasons for it? We've got to have clear objectives for our restoration or enhancement projects. Then one of the most important things we want to do is do a site assessment. And we try and determine, document, Stages of degradation, regeneration, what are the plants there, what are the animals there. Then we determine, sit down and have a discussion, brainstorming session on the different restoration and reforestation techniques that we want to apply. We always work as a team. And as Stephen, as well as Bruce had mentioned, a broad range of expertise and a broad and a wide range of team people, stakeholders are involved with this restoration project. From the planners who would have to help us um, help us safeguard those areas. We need botanists, we need zoologists, we need landscape architects, we involve designers, and we involve the horticulturists. We would then determine whether we need to enhance the site or do we need to reforest it, it very heavily? And we make decisions like, do we just use the assisted natural generation method with minimum intervention? So we just go and weed it a bit, add a few plants, get rid of the um, uh, uh, predators, the pests, or do we have to put in a bit more effort and use the framework species method, which means that we would then have to plant up at least 10% of dominance. And we then debate over what plants do we do, at what intensity do we plant them, where do we plant them to maximize our efforts. Or do we actually then aim for maximum species diversity and try and reach the climax state as much as possible. Now again, it's no point having all enhancement, enrichment, restoration projects aiming for climax uh, um, you know, state simply because we want stages the different zero stages, representative zero stages throughout Singapore. Because different species thrive in different ecosystems and different zero stages. 
And what we find most important is the monitoring process and both monitoring of both flora and fauna in a systematic way. I'm going to now just very briefly, briefly because time is rushing by, um, to share with you some of the projects that we have done, a wide range of projects. This is an East Coast Park, which is a very, very popular park. And if those of you who um, have visited Singapore, you find that you land in Changi Airport, and when you drive from Changi Airport to the city, on your left-hand side, if you're going towards the city, there is this linear park, East Coast Park. And here, what has been carried out is actually um, efforts at trying to plant and establish uh, more native plants all along areas that used to be just turf. Telok Blanga Hill Park is right smack in the city, as you can see, the tall buildings all in the background. And what we have done is planted up with native forest species and fruit bearing trees so that the birds can thrive just like us in right smack in the center of Singapore City. In Pulau Ubin, we have some quarries that have been uh, are disused quarries. So what we have here are um, our end park staff with the consultants putting plants, wetland plants, on these mats, and on a boat, they then decide which is the best place to place these um, mats of, um, uh, that, that will form the basis, the substrate of a wetland. And note that on the right hand side, you have um, uh, 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 these mats that are grown. On the left hand side, you can't very clearly, but there are all these egrets that have nested as a result of this habitat enhancement using floating wetlands. It's not only the um, terrestrial and freshwater quarries, we also do enhancement and habitat protection of our mangroves. This picture shows you mangroves that had fallen due to very strong wicks. And then this is another picture showing you how the mangroves, um, uh, um, even the roots, even the uh, very strong anchoring, um, you know, uh, stilt roots have been, you know, couldn't keep the plants up. So what do we do next? What do we do about it? First of all, we didn't want to just build a wall to keep out the strong waves. So we insisted on planting using a hybrid approach. Just mangroves alone on the coastline would not be able to survive the strong wakes. So we built, we then constructed a very, very low rock revertment, but then planted in between this rock. That have that are planted with um, mangroves. We were adamant that it was not single species, but a wide number of species emulating that 
of a natural mangrove site. Resource seeds from the natural, from the area that we were going to enhance. And so all the seeds, the mangrove plants, were actually from the natural stock. And we set up an off-site nursery so that the plants could also acclimatize before planting them out. We observed the natural zonation of the plants so that we could select the best plants for each planting them in biodegrader planter rings so that they would degrade in about two years or more when the plants, when the mangrove plants have established themselves. The contractors at the back the, the contractors immediate let's backfill it with sediment. We were shocked and we say no 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 there was no way we'd allow them to backfill these mangroves. So we made them put the sediment in bags and so we had contractors who were also tailors and the bags were then carefully pushed in for the undercut. So at low tide, this is how it looked like. And in high tide, it shows you on the right hand side what the mangroves look like. It's about two, three years since we did that project. And what we found, real bonus for us, was we not only have mangroves, but we have soft corals, and we have all sorts of uh, sea anemones and various other things, all growing marine organisms, all colonizing. Surprises all the time. So um, there are many more stories to, but I think um, we are running out of time, and we would like some time for questions, if we may, from our patient uh, listeners. I would like to thank Zibin, Jermaine, Hui Ping, and Fahana for helping me with the um, uh, for contributing some of these slides. Thank you. So the floor is open for questions, and uh, please type them into your question box, or since the audience is uh, not uh, incredibly large, that's, uh, I can have an overview. You can also raise your hand if you want. We can take your questions verbally and engage in a short discussion with you. Uh, Bruce, uh, are you getting reinvasion of the alien plant species uh, in the more mature areas? Is this a continuing management problem? Oh, okay, thank you. So yes, there is some uh, reinvasion. Um, and the reinvasion, it's about managing critical times of reinvasion. So the particularly critical time of enhancement planting at about years 10, and that is the critical time for example for reinvasion by exotic vines which may colonize and come into gaps and then start a process of you know climbing over top of, of your plantings so um, the, the important thing though is that many of the problem weeds which are ground cover species if you can get Good canopy cover. You limit you limit their um, aggressiveness. You li you limit their opportunities for regeneration. And so, what you're trying to do always is essentially 
have a scenario where when a disturbance of some form occurs, it's about the probability, what will pop up? Will it be a native plant or will it be an exotic plant? If you've gained canopy dominance and if you have trees and shrubs that are reproducing and that the seed is being incorporated into the seed bank, so you get to a point at about 20 years where the dominance of the seed bank shifts and if you've got mutually supporting plantings in the vicinity, you can also get to a point where the seed rain dominance shifts. So you're constantly thinking about the processes which lead to the dominance of native species after a disturbance has occurred. And so yes, there's always going to be some reinvasion, but if you can address these issues, you progressively get to a point where you require less and less and less maintenance. Thank you very much, Bruce, for that answer. Are there any more questions from the audience? Or our presenters? Um, I agree with uh, uh, Bruce that, and, and Stephen too, that in our um, uh, restoration and enhancement projects, we are now uh, studying much more the ecology and leveraging on natural uh, regeneration rather than having to actually put in ecosystem can actually um, recover themselves, uh, give them enough. The other thing that we are doing quite a lot now is actually looking at species recovery and species recovery cannot proceed without habitat enhancement and that is what we found which is why the, um, the, the uh, habitat enhancement and restoration is key to um, conservation um, actions, I think, in urban areas. Thank you, Lena. So I have some feedback from uh, Jessica Goodenough, who is with us in the audience today. She is working for Trade Economics and the Open University in the United Kingdom. And she simply wants to say thank you for the valuable insights given today by the speakers. Okay, I think we satisfied our audience. They uh, have been fed with a lot of new information and case studies. So, um, Lena, I hand over to you to wrap up our webinar. Yes, um, it has ex been an extremely insightful, um, enriching session. I would like to thank um, Stephen, Bruce, Louisa, Fia, and Chia Wei, who's right next to me helping me out. So thank you very, very much. I'm sure we will keep in touch and share in this very um, important initiative in biodiversity conservation. Thank you very much, and good morning, good night, good day. Bye bye. And bye, -bye. I'd like to thank David too, David Maddox, for making all this happen too. Thank you.